Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Rare Agent, where we peel back the curtain on all things real estate. Today, we are your hosts, Christina and Jennifer. Kelly is sadly away, and we have with us a very lovely guest, Dan Plowman of the Dan Plowman team, having sold over a billion dollars in real estate and being the number one team in Durham region. We are so grateful to have you on our podcast today. I'm very Thanks excited. I'm very Thank excited to, to meet you in Appreciate person. It. Thank you. Yeah. We had to peel you away from the cottage. We had a little bit of a chat beforehand. <laughs> I know you were up enjoying Balsam Lake. You have a lovely place up there. We do. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Love it. We love it up there. And uh, and we love Durham Region. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. It's not too far. Not far. An not hour far. and 10. That's right. Yeah, it's not it's far It's convenient to the cottage, yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So we like to start off each podcast with a little bit of an introduction to who you are, how you got started in real estate, and go. Mm -hmm. Okay. I came from uh, heating and air conditioning. I'm an HVAC background. My family was all in HVAC. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having my dad, my father done it, my older brother, you just kind of follow that path. So I ended up in HVAC um, at a very young age. By the age of 25, I had built a business of 20 plus people uh, working with me, had sold it to my brother at 25 because I wanted to go into real estate. And I did. I know we're going to talk more about that, but that's where I came from. I came from the HVAC industry, sold that company to my brother, built it up, sold it to him, and he's still running it to this day. That's incredible. Yeah. So an entrepreneur mm. at heart. Yeah. That's what what made you decide to sort of branch off and go into real estate? Well, I, I realized at uh, this young age of working in HVAC that, uh, you know, you'd wake up in the morning, five o'clock, you were six o'clock on site. Sometimes I did a lot of new construction as well. And then at night I'd go into the sales for the other portion, which was, you know, helping people convert their furnaces from all the gas or whatever. But it was nice that I could do that as well. That was the real money, not just the construction. That was the bread and butter. But I was working these 15 hour days thinking, this is too hard. I don't want to work this hard. This is mm -hmm. crazy. But I did build the business again, sold it to my brother. I thought, I'll go into real estate. Look at these realtors. They have the <laughs> nicest clothes. They have the nicest cars. Mm -hmm. They're wealthy. These people are rich. Not true, really. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but it sure looked great, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I went to real estate. Plus, and the biggest point I think was the part I enjoyed the most of my work days in HVAC was being able to go out in the evening and do the, the sales calls. I really loved being with people, talking to them, explaining what was best for their, you know, HVAC needs, interacting. I loved that part of the business. I can remember going home tired and being excited to go back out to work because that was the part of the business I loved the most. So mm -hmm. I believe it was a good fit for me. And I, I think it was. So that's why, I, you know, was geared or pushed towards real estate, if you will. Okay. So what, what do you believe made you successful from the get-go? Is it, what sort of lead generation tactics took you from zero to something? Well, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't, I mean, I, I know a lot of realtors think lead generation is everything. And uh, unfortunately, it's not. Lead generation can break you if you don't know how to convert, track, and understand what works and what does not. So there's a lot to it. But I think what led me or helped with my success early on was the work ethic, possibly that I had acquired having been and developed the habits I had in HVAC. 15 hour days didn't scare me didn't scare me at all. I actually thought I was going to real estate to cut that in half. It wasn't the case. <laughs> in the first five years in the business, you've got to do that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you got to work, but you've got to love it. But here was the cool part for me. I was now doing that part that I love the most, being with people, talking mm -hmm. to people. So that was cool. I got to go do that. Now, with regards to the second part of your question, lead generation, absolutely. I mean, without leads, we're lost. Without leads, without contacts, we have nothing. I, I agree. But you know, leads are an interesting thing. Do you buy them? Do you acquire them? Well, I mean, I could drive down the road, stop to get gas. Somebody could talk to me and I could acquire a lead if I just happened to converse with the person and let them know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. That potentially could become a lead. So ultimately, what I think most realtors miss in our industry is understanding that leads are everywhere. Mm. Leads are everywhere. So I, I think I learned that very early on. I would talk to people, whether it was, you know, at my community church that I attended at the time, whether it was where I played basketball, wherever it was, I was shouting from the highest mountain what I did, who I worked with, and why they should work with me. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that's important. I genuinely do. I think it's really important. Do you feel that, did you have to actually niche down when you first started? Or to your point, in talking to everybody, you kind of were everywhere at any time? Well, niche down, yeah. Well, I, I, I do believe that there's some um, value that can come from specializing, if you will. Uh, but I, I also think that 
quite often people get caught up in one thing specifically to the point where they they miss other opportunities. So mm -hmm. I, it's an interesting question. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. For me, I know when I was first in the business, I would go on the odd listing appointment when I would get them. I mean, 25 to 30 year old guy in real estate, that's my first five years in the business. Mm -hmm. You're pretty young, inexperienced going in on the odd listing appointment that you'd get called in on and getting beat up because you know, clients or homeowners are always interviewing the top realtors in the area. Well, that wasn't me. Mm -hmm. And guess what happens? You get a lot of practice and you don't get any listings, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So what I did, speak about niche, I worked with a lot of buyers. And mm -hmm. I actually loved it and prospered by it mm -hmm. to the point where that's where my focus was. I would do open houses to pick up buyers. Hey, if I sold a house from an open house, don't get me wrong, I was happy. But we know that doesn't usually happen, mm -hmm. right? Open houses allow us to meet people. And sure, it allows them to see the home. Don't get me wrong, that's important. Uh, but the odd one might buy that home. We know from stats and having tracked, it's over one in 120 people that come to an open house will actually buy the house they walk through. Mm -hmm. So again, I track, we track everything, right? We track everything. So, but if the other people coming through the home, if only half of those other people are potential buyers, there's 60 potential buyers. If 30 of them qualify or 15 of them are serious, you have the opportunity to work with 15 potential buyers. You know, and that might have been over the course of a month or two months to acquire that many people coming through open houses. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. don't, don't get me wrong. Or you could do it like I used to do it. I remember interviewing a top realtor saying, what do you do? How do you make money? And he said, I do an open house every other weekend. So I said, do it two a month. Okay, I'll do one a week. And I thought, okay, I'll do two every week. Oh, I'll do four. I can do one on Saturday from 12 to 2, 2.30 to 4.30. I can do the same thing on Sunday. That's four every week. That's 16 a month. Surely I can increase my volume mm -hmm. if I do more of what he's doing, you know, to the 10th or nth degree. And I did. So I picked up more buyers. I had a, I had great momentum, rookie of the year, took off, but it was work. It was constant work. It was just replicating, duplicating, doing more of what was successful for others. And I genuinely believe we quite often complicate this business. Meet more people, track what you do, keep great contact information with those people, acquire permission to communicate with them and follow up with them, and then do it. Mm-hmm. Business is just a natural byproduct of doing the right things. I genuinely believe that. I love it. You yeah. actually, I, you actually um, skip it too simple. Like yeah. it's like it's, yeah. we complicate it. Mm -hmm. A lot of us complicate. Well, what if I try this? So what if I try that? I've I haven't done posted it. today. Yeah, what if I right. haven't posted today? Yeah. What if I? I need yeah. to post something. Yeah, like right. totally. Right. It's just basics. Mm -hmm. And you that. actually, um, I have a question a little bit later down, uh, specifically asking, do you think you need to list to last or can you niche down as a buyer's agent? And I love that you kind of just, I don't know, serendipitously mm -hmm. took on that. That's how you actually started. So that is absolutely wonderful. Um, so beyond that then, so you obviously have been a realtor for a number of years. When did you decide that it was time to take on a team and expand that? What does your team look like? How big is it? Uh, about 12 field reps, partners. Um, we have, I think, actually, I shouldn't say that because I know Tammy, my director of operations, just finished training with two more. So I think we're 14 now. They're just coming. We don't allow them to work with clients until they've gone through training. We don't want people practicing on clients. So their ability to uh, use the right language, communicate well, service a client properly is up to snuff, beyond up to snuff, up to par, if you will, well before they're even uh, given the opportunity to work with clients. So two just made the team. They made, got through the training. Do you do the same type of training with with seasoned agents as as new agents, or is it, is that just the Dan Plowman way? Like so everybody? what do you mean by seasoned? Because when I hear seasoned, I think of more bad habits and they're more difficult sometimes. Uh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> They've been I'm, 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 I'm joking and I'm not. <laughs> no, no, right? I agree with you on sure. that. Everybody thinks everybody they... everybody goes through the same thing, and mm -hmm. if. A season agent comes to me and says they know this, 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 and they don't need that. Trust me, they don't make the team. Humility yeah. is a big part of success and how you're able to get there. Look, my goal as a team leader is to ensure that people hit six figures with no expenses within the first 12 months working on the team. If they don't, I failed them. Oh, wow. So that's what we do. And we do it in a way that they appreciate, understand, and are grateful to be a part of it. And we're grateful for them, too. Please don't get me wrong. It's win-win. I'm not trying to mm -hmm. sound, I hope I don't sound arrogant here when I say it. 
But yeah. I really believe it's important to stay the course, follow the process, because we have a great client base. And if we put the right people in front of those clients consistently, we will continue to grow. They will continue to prosper. And most importantly, the consumer will continue to have the best service. That's one of the reasons why we're not only selling the most homes, we get more than the board average consistently for almost 10 years now when we sell people's homes in Durham Region. That's a big statement. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Absolutely. One of your agents does really catchy videos that I've seen on your on your Instagram. I don't know his name, but I find him very entertaining. Glenn Coe? Yeah. Glenn I see, does some cool ones. Yeah. yeah I see him some dancing. of them are funny. Yeah. yeah. That, that's Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just thought of somebody on your team and I was like, that's the one I well, know. Well, there you but, go. Yeah. See, that's cool. It's all and you and it's nice that they could do they can do their own personality coming through their marketing. Like not everybody on your team does those dancing videos, but the fact that he can and and some do don't really, like doing it. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Um, but that's not to say they're not busy out with their clients working. Exactly. Right? So but yeah, that's that's interesting. You remember, remember that. It's cool. So before we move on to our next segment, I just wanted to ask, we often ask agents what their typical day looks like. As a team leader and as a coach now, what does your typical day look like? How do you go about structuring everything? Well, it's very different than it was, you know, 10, 12 years ago when mm -hmm. I was actively running buyers and enlisting appointments, obviously. Uh, but specific to now, uh, I have a, a marketing team. I have a lead conversion department. Both have managers that oversee those departments. And I have a director of operations who oversees the team who's in the office full time. So those people have full time roles and their job and their description as to what they do. Very clear as well as the people that work within their department. So they report and provide me with things that allow me to see how things are progressing in each department regularly. I communicate with them. They're my go-to people. Not to say I don't talk to everybody else when I'm in the office. I'm just not in the office as much as I was. So specific to the team, it has been running long enough now that we have uh, it's a pretty well-oiled machine in that regard. Those people understand their duties and roles and they follow them very well. Don't get me wrong. I still take that, you know, once to twice a year where I'll review and that's coming up now, job descriptions so that there's a clear understanding moving forward before we move into those last two months, November and December, which is business planning, goal setting for the next year, right? Uh, reviewing how we did. So, and that's exciting in itself as well. But job descriptions often get altered as time passes without constant reminder of what you should be doing. And, and I think that's important. So there's a lot of stuff that I do that's more specific to the business and operations than the customer one-on-one -on -one now, because I have a team and partners that do that as well. They're part of a part of that group of the team, if you will. With regards to coaching and training company, yes, I do spend some time, quite a bit of time over there because our systems and the things that we've integrated that allow even the, the, the new realtor starting out to hit that six-figure mark within the first 12 months, we've put those into a program called Point One that's very affordable for everyone because we've noticed that target market's probably over 80% of the realtors on the Toronto Real Estate Board and right across Canada. As a matter of fact, we have clients as far south as Texas. So we've put together packages to take care of those people so that they can plug it in and notice results immediately doing the same things that my team members do. We have other packages that allow people to, you know, if they have a team and they're just starting a team and other people who have mega teams that maybe want to better their lead conversion department. So we have different options, different coaches that are uh, well-trained and understand our When did you branch off into systems. that part of your business? 12, 13 years now. Oh, okay. Yeah. A while. Yeah. The team was doing very, very well. And I said, look, we got to share this. This is good stuff. It's working. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to answer and address one of your other questions, I'll go back a little bit. I hope I don't digress, but I will say I do remember vividly when I hit about 62, 63 deals a year on my own and I was starting to drop some balls, which mm -hmm. we do as individual realtors. We drop balls all the time. We have a lot. We, have a, we wear a lot of hats. We've all heard that term. We wear many hats, sure. right? And, we, you know, whether it's even sometimes marriage counseling or psychiatry, <laughs> we wear a lot of hats, right? Mm -hmm. But I remember so I was starting to um, frustrate people. And I remember thinking, I got to go back to about 45 ends, 40, maybe even 40, because that's when I was at my best, where I was, it was smooth. Everybody was being taken care of. I was, you know, returning all calls, emails, texts. Back, I can go way back, pages even, for those who remember that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but I, I can honestly say 60 plus was too many for the individual realtor. So I decided- You didn't have an assistant at that no, point? No, it was just me. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. You were yeah it was too much. It was too much. Oh and gosh. and plus I was- purchaser's visits, all that stuff. It was too like, much. Yeah. It was too much. So I had to mm -hmm. either pull back or 
uh, start to um, uh, bring in people. Right. Mm -hmm. Leverage people, technology, marketing. I went, I took that path and I'm grateful I did. Uh, the intention originally was so that uh, my, my wife now and I could maybe have some kids, which we have. We've had three together and uh, maybe have more time at home so that I didn't go back through the same thing I did with my first set of kids. I call them first letter, second letter, <laughs> just because they hate that. Right. <laughs> but I didn't see those kids much growing up because I was doing my 15 hour work weeks. I did not want to repeat the same mistakes. And I knew being the, in the best business in the world, real estate, that I could acquire systems and partners and pieces that I had not yet put into play that would allow me to have a different lifestyle, but still grow business. And it did work. It did work. I made mistakes. Don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but uh, costly mistakes. And, and with the coaching and training company, we take that away from people. I think one of the biggest fears people have in trying something new is that it'll cost me money and I might make a mistake. Or I've seen them make mistakes and then they freeze and they don't do anything else. It's easier to do myself. Forget it. I'm not doing that again. And, and that itself is a shame too, because part of moving forward includes sometimes two steps forward, one back. Yeah. Sometimes it's four steps forward, three back. Sometimes it's two forward, three back. But if you're at the end of lots of steps at the end of a month winning, keep keep making mistakes. It's okay. As long as your mistakes are less than the steps forward, you're, you're doing okay. Absolutely. I remember years ago being in um, the president of Ontario, Remax Ontario Atlantic's uh, office. And they said to him, I said, your desk is so clean. How do you do this? Like, I'm a mess. When I'm working, I'm a mess. <laughs> and it's just my profile, my personality. I get a lot done, but I get a lot going on. Don't touch it. Just don't touch it. I know where everything is. And he said... Uh, well, Danny says, I just make decisions quickly. I said, so I don't leave anything on my desk. I make a decision. He said, I don't always make the right decision, but I make the right decision more than 51% of the mm -hmm. time, which means we're moving forward. Mm -hmm. I thought, that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. All right. It doesn't have to be 100%. No. As long as you're moving Keep forward. moving. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Simple and good. Don't complicate it. And we do. We do. So how do you think, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping in one oh, more no, time. No, no, no. How do you think that the real estate industry has changed since you first started? Ooh, good question. Loaded question. Mm -hmm. Well, lots, I mean, there's a there. lot. A lot going through my mind right now. I remember when I started in November of 89. And uh, I remember because my broker said to me, Dan, the day you started in the business is the day the market took a dive. I said, oh, that's <laughs> really nice. Thanks. I feel good about being here now. <laughs> you know, and it did. It, it literally changed overnight. Interest rates shot up to 18, 19%. People were handing their keys back to the banks. I remember Durham Region Real Estate Board, because Trap hadn't merged yet. I think we were 2,600 realtors, went down to 1,300 within 20 months. Mm. They were leaving the business. It was it was brutal. It was scary. I had three little kids at home. I'm like, did I make a mistake selling my HVAC company? You know, but I had no choice. I moved forward. So ask me the question again now. Mm -hmm. How has the real estate industry changed? Okay. So flash forward 30 plus years, because that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you, it was a very different world then in that the population growth everywhere has literally doubled or more, which it has in Durham. Which, what's most interesting, though, about change in our industry is how business is done. You know, I can remember having to go pick up keys to show a home, to return the keys. So I think technology has helped us. Mm -hmm. And it's also plugged our bandwidth a little bit because it's given us too many things too quickly. Things are moving so fast sometimes. I believe that quite often things happen a little too fast. Now, I don't, I don't want to sound old because I think technology is great, but you've got to harness it and understand it to the point where it serves you and you don't become a victim of it and reactive where you don't have a life. This business is supposed to you know, supply us with a great life, not the other way around. <laughs> right? yeah, so, absolutely. so be careful, you know, leverage it, but make sure it's not controlling you is what I'm trying to say. Population growth, massive change there. Infrastructure in Durham region. I can't say enough about how fast it's growing. The business, I think the biggest change I've seen in the business is the population and the culture of realtors with regards to uh, the amount of people that have a license and do it part-time. I think that's the biggest additional change I've witnessed over the years. I don't remember part-time realtors yeah, in 1990, 91, 92. Mm -hmm. I don't remember it. I genuinely do not. Um, and I do believe now, um, you know, with Trab, Rico, or Rhea, and I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but if the agenda is, um, you know, members, mm -hmm. guess what? They're doing a great job. We've succeeded. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of uh, television programming mm -hmm. that may have, uh, or Instagram or social media sort of 
um, has a part to play in the fact that so many people have wanted to become a real estate agent. Especially in the last A lot few more years. people need side gigs now. Like well one said. income, one income isn't yeah. uh, enough for a lot of people. So they think, oh, why not? I like become a realtor, not realizing that it's, it doesn't just stop you. You're a 24, it's like a 24 hour job sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm just not sure it's best for the consumer and who's ever watching no. out for the consumer ministry, consumer corporate affairs, whoever it is, maybe should consider or understand that. Well, I get a cab in Vegas now and then, and every time they hand me their real estate card, the cab driver. Well, stop. <laughs> oh, okay. Really? Oh, it's the same in California. It's, and it's become the same here as you, to your point. Yeah. It has. Yeah. An Uber driver. Oh yeah. I sell real estate too. Sure. And it's like, okay, great. Awesome. awesome. Good. Good for you. Good to know. I can get, <laughs> I can get driven around. My gas is covered. Oh, hang on a second. If an Uber driver drives you around and sells you home, does he bill you for the Uber ride? I, it's a good question. I would think it would be gratis, but I don't know. <laughs> That's how it feels sometimes as realtors, though. Absolutely. We're just driving them around. <laughs> 100%. So being somebody who's been in the industry for so long, what could you say is a tip or trick you would give a new agent? Uh, I, I guess the best tip or trick would be to understand you don't need tips and tricks. Mm-hmm. I think the mm-hmm. biggest thing you need to understand is that this is a job. Yeah. Just because you're not punching a card, reporting to a boss nine to five, mm-hmm. and somebody's overseeing or watching you while you do your work and you're forced to do your work. First of all, if you're forced, you maybe are I picked the wrong industry because your passion and love for this business. I remember when I first got my license, I jumped out of bed, my feet at the ground. I was so excited, right? And why do we lose that passion and feeling for the business? Well, because it beats us up a bit. That's the truth, yeah. right? That's the truth. So do what you can to keep that feeling. And I genuinely believe that the tip or trick, and I, because I don't mean to play on words, but the tip or trick, the best tip or trick would be instill a worth work ethic into yourself that is specific to dollar productive activities and track it as much as you can every day and success is yours. I promise you, this is the best business in the world. Don't let it beat you up, but you must work it. You must work it. And I think too many realtors don't look at it as a job. That would be my tip or trick. They don't look at it as work because any business, any successful entrepreneur that I've ever met or talked to, and I mean successful, They have had their five to seven years of 15 hour days, six, sometimes seven days a week. And I'm not exaggerating. And even some of those fail. So Mm -hmm. you think you're going to pull this off with 20 or 25 hour work weeks of which you call work weeks and you count your 25 hours, part of it being your one hour drive to work and back. That's not working or standing, talking to somebody in the lunch room. That's not working. So track, make sure you have a specific agenda, what you're doing daily that's dollar productive. And I promise, I promise you'll succeed. One of the biggest problems is people don't know what that means, what I just said. So if you need help understanding or implementing specific things that are going to bring business and success your way, just Google Dan Plowman Coaching. We'll t- there's my plug. We, <laughs> we will provide those things, mm-hmm. right? That's Absolutely. awesome. Yeah, I, I was actually reading up on your coaching and, you know, making sure I knew what I was talking about when you came here. And I thought this is so beneficial to somebody who, like, one, the fact that you have something that's more economical, because sometimes people think coaching can be very expensive. It and, can be. Yeah. So that's one thing where, you know, p- plug and play, like use these systems. And because agents come to into brokerage and they have no idea what they're doing. And they say, people say, oh, we have training. But what does that even mean? Well said. Yeah. Right. So right. Uh, I think what you're doing is um, phenomenal. And the fact that you've like been in the business for so long and I can remember you from my childhood being on TV is is really awesome. Uh, I guess we'll go into Durham region. Like, oh, before we do, oh, I'm go- I have a few more, a few more coaching questions oh, that I am going to get to. No worries, no worries. A couple just kind of came to me. So I, I am do very it. curious. <laughs> <laughs> Two things, and I hope that I'm going to remember them. But what makes an agent coachable? Uh, I love that one. Good one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it, that's interesting. That's a, again, a great question. Um, I think you guys have done this a few times. Huh? <laughs> you know what? We're getting good. Yeah, we're getting successfully. <laughs> we're not sweating anymore either. We're all like, we're pretty cool. Yeah, no, it's pretty cool. She touched I my love, hand. She I didn't say, oh my God. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is cool. No, I love it. <laughs> yeah. What makes an agent successful? Is that what you coachable. Mean? Coachable. 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 So, well, that's a good question. Um, desire. Mm. for um, moving forward. I, I I think, like, what's the old saying? You can lead a horse to water, you can't make him drink. The teacher appears when the student is ready. Mm. So I, I've had people come into our coaching programs, literally throw their credit cards at us and say, okay, just make my team work. Whoa, 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 whoa. hang on a second. I don't want or need your money. Mm-hmm. We really enjoy helping people. We have systems that work. If you can implement them turnkey, exactly what I do, and I don't teach, coach, or train people in Durham for a reason. I don't teach my, or develop my, 
competition, but everywhere else, right through North America, we do. So if you can take what I do, replicate, you'll have great success. It works. Mm. So I guess it depends on when and where they are in their life, their business. Uh, the most coachable to answer your question, the most and the biggest, best thing that I've ever found in all of the students that I have that are either partners on my team or coaching clients, uh, one word I'd have to say, humility. Mm. Mm. I believe humility makes, now how you get there, whether it's because you've been beat up in the business or you're just genuinely like that. Look, I have a guy on my team who's been with me almost 10 years now and still maintains Im immense, immense humility, gratitude for everything that the team provides. This guy makes over 650 a year with no expenses. And, you know, he just took off when he came into our business, just took off, came from advertising business in the background and in, in the past. And then I have some people on the team, partners have the same tools, same clients, same appointments, same everything. And they struggle to make 200. Why mm. is that? I, I think when I see that, humility is a big part of that formula. And then when I think outside of that to coaching clients, the most successful people that have taken things and run with them have had a humble environment, whether it's their team or themselves. It usually comes from the team leader down. So I would have to say humility if I had to give you one. <laughs> okay, no, that, that's absolutely lovely. Is there any key attribute that you see when you first meet someone and you know that, you know what, this guy's going to be successful? Is it the humility part? I, aside I think from humility that, is or? a big part of it. Um, I mean, I, 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 I'm concerned whenever somebody comes to us in desperation, that concerns me because knee-jerk quick responses or, or quick um, fixes for problems don't happen in our business. Mm -hmm. Like, look, for example, you know, if somebody's having a great, great successful month, uh, I could look back 70 to 90 days prior and I can – track what they were doing. If I could see what they were doing for those days, 90 days prior, I could tell you exactly why they're doing well now, 90 mm -hmm. days later, because um, it's trackable. It's, mm -hmm. it's obvious. And, and you know, that brings me to a point with regards to my business for many years, I had the peaks and valleys. I did this for many, many years. And it was because I could go back and look 90 days prior to what I was doing. And then I'd get busy and it was great. And then I'd sell a bunch of homes, but then I stopped doing all those things, got me busy for those 60 days. So then I wasn't busy for six. So I had to start again, peaks and valleys. So, Success obviously always leaves clues. Uh, I hope I kind of answered yeah, your question. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you totally did. So beyond that, just a couple more, mm -hmm. sorry. Beyond that, this uh, particular climate or, or market has a lot of agents feeling quite down and beat up on themselves. Yeah. Are there any sort of things that you can think of that would pick them up off their feet? After the last, I like that like, you're using humble, to, hum, humility. The, yeah. last, the last three years of, of all of us having that low hanging fruit that was pretty, pretty easy. Oh, yeah, exactly. It is humbling. And That's then how I this feel. year, mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. yeah. for some people, flat. Mm -hmm. It's changed. Yeah. It's definitely changed. You look here. If if, mm -hmm. if if you've not been in the business more than five or seven years, this may be the first time you're feeling mm -hmm. that. I've mm -hmm. I felt to this degree, this kind of change at least three times mm -hmm. that I remember. You know, in 30 years, 30 plus years, it's probably been more, mm -hmm. but, but to this degree, cause this is quite excessive in my opinion, the change, the shift. So I think that's what you're asking. Yes. You know, it's how like do whiplash. you help people? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like whiplash. How do you help people now have whiplash? Ow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the market changed, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, the low hanging fruit was pretty easy. We were all, you know, if you had a, if you had a buyer and they were serious and you might have had to do four or five offers with 20 offers each time before they got home, but you were going to get a deal, right? And, and and if you had a seller, it was gold, right? That was like finding gold. So, and now you can't find a buyer that's qualified or they're not sure if they want to buy because they're sitting on a fence and good luck getting a seller because they seem to be listing with the bigger teams. And I'm noticing that gap between, you know, the average realtor and the, the, the mega teams are the successful, the brands. Uh, more people are calling the brands. More people are going that path. Anybody could have listed with their niece or their nephew and given them a few bucks and they got the listing and they knew they were going to get top dollar because they get multiple offers anyway. It's not, that's gone. So to answer your question, the best thing I can tell somebody who's serious that still wants to be in this business, okay, and it's full time, is stay, stay the course, but maybe change it a bit. Because if your course didn't include, you know, uh, six, four to six hours a day of prospecting. And by prospecting, that can mean a number of things. I mentioned open house, I talked about open house, I think, or did I talk about that beforehand? Yeah, yes, yes. So, you know, prospecting means you need to meet people. You need to talk to people, but be careful. Don't be so driven and always looking for the deal. That's one of the worst things we can do in our business. 
Deals are a natural byproduct of doing the right things. Here's what I'd love for people to look for every day when they come into work. And again, if you need help with dollar productive activities, I can help you. I can give you the specifics of where you can spend six solid great hours a day and be guaranteed, you know, 100, 150,000 a year or more. I, I could do that. That's not difficult for me. But here's what realtors need to focus on, especially now in this market, to answer your question. Really focus on how many people can I talk to today that will just give me permission to stay in contact with them knowing I'm a realtor. That's it. It's that simple. I don't care if you're buying a home today or not. I know you're going to buy or sell a home in the next few years. Mm -hmm. I know whether that's eight or 10 years, I don't even care about that because I'm still going to be selling real estate. That's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. So do I really care if you sell with me now or in eight, 10 years? Well, maybe if I have lots of bills right now, but you, you see my point though. Mm -hmm. If my focus daily is, if imagine if I captured just three great communications or conversations in a day where people said, yes, I, you can go, I can go in your database. And yes, you can call me back. And yes, I'll give you permission to, to uh, talk to me and ask me after we build rapport, whether or not my brothers and sisters and friends and family will buy and sell from you. Cause I will give the, you them too. Imagine if that's how clear the conversation was. Well, really that's what's happening when we're trying to just acquire a couple or three people a day. Sounds easy, doesn't it? It's not. That will give mm -hmm. us permission to allow us to follow up with them regularly. So if my focus now as a realtor in this market that has shifted is not about doing deals. My focus is about communicating with people and acquiring as many people as possible at the end of a week. That means six days a week, not five. That means evenings and mornings because so, some people don't answer the calls mm -hmm. during the day. That means making sure that's your focus and then having a really great contact relationship management system. Uh, real estate flow is the best for realtors, built by realtors, for realtors. But that's the very best advice I can give anyone because if you do that and you you stay that course for 30 days, and oh, by the way, don't do it for four days and say, this doesn't work, I'm gonna try something else because I hear that all the time. Do that for 30 days and watch how your business takes off and then maintain it. With intention. I absolutely 100%. love, love, love that answer. Our broker says something similar in that, but and it's it's for uh, it's more so for sales. But you don't day trade real estate. Real estate is a long game, and as long as what I'm gathering from you is you can weather the storm and build that network and maintain it, then you will be prosperous for years to come. Hundred percent. What what storm? Storms are going to happen. People always need to buy and sell real estate. I did very well my first five years in the business when you know the the membership cut in half and the amount of sales cut in half. I did very well because I stayed the course. I didn't even know there was a storm. I wasn't allowed to think that way. I had to work hard, but I talked to a lot of people. If you talk to and meet a lot of people and they know you do real estate and know you're passionate about it, guess what? They'll say, okay, I kind of like you. I don't mm -hmm. know why, I don't know why, but I just kind of like that person. You know, <laughs> that's what happens. You know, if you show that you're hungry, if you show that you're, you're competent, that you're, you know, that there's, you know, they're, their buy or sell is really important to you. 100%. They're gonna, they're they, feel, gonna, they feel that. Yeah, and you're interested absolutely. in a genuine relationship versus yeah. making a deal out of the one conversation you have with them. They feel that. Yeah. I agree 100%. Okay. Relationships over transactions. Relationships over transactions, transactions always. Always. <laughs> always. Always. Is that, that's something you, that's your key phrase. Is one of them. I love it. <laughs> one of it. I love it. Yes. Yeah. That's, thank you. Thank <laughs> Good you. Good on you. Good on you. Yeah. Yeah. Philosophy, I love it. Which I love. So are you going to expand into Durham region? Sure. Uh, okay. For, so since you first started in real estate, we've already kind of talked about like population growth. How has Durham real estate changed in your opinion? Well, again, maybe technology is faster, more part-time realtors, uh, more, more Toronto realtors coming east to sell their buyers homes because uh, they feel they can service them just as well or understand pockets of areas that they can advise on and they usually don't. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's another, I'm not here to, to beat that up. I, I'm grateful for people who bring buyers. I'm grateful for realtors all over. They're all my partners. Toronto Real Estate Board is now Durham as well. Um, and, and by no means, I hope I don't sound like I, I'm putting a kibosh on growth and development because I, I, I think it's great. And specific to Durham, the change, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Like how, how is the, philo like the, the, uh, average buyer who who is moving to Durham? Like, well, how has it changed over the years? Well, the You've prices been prices have gone just oh, crazy, crazy. skyrocketed. It's nuts. I've noticed that no one really talks about the taxes anymore. Well, it's, they, they it's almost on like they. I think especially if you're if you're from Toronto. So it's, it's funny you say that. My yeah. wife and I were walking through the home show one year, and they were petitioning. There was a there were Toronto people that had taken a booth to petition against the taxes and how they were rising. So we came up and said, "What's this about?" And she 
She explained, very mm. gracious. And I said, oh, we're from Durham Region. Oh, she said, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Just keep walking. <laughs> because our taxes are higher. Now, yes. you know, infrastructure, right? I mean, you could build uh, sidewalks and subways for, you know, $4 an hour back in the 20s, you can't do that now. So, you know, taxes are higher because we're just building some infrastructure in Durham now. Oh, so yeah. it's understandable. Um, yeah, taxes are high. Prices mm -hmm. are high. Uh, great community. I love yeah. it. I love Toronto too. Don't get me wrong. I've had, I've lived here as well in my life many times. Um, but Durham is changing. It's changing quickly. The infrastructure, the 407, the highways, uh, the GO trains, it's changing fast. It's definitely growing up and allowing for growth. You know what I am noticing in Durham region, which is interesting, and you may not have heard this before. I'm noticing more and more people that used to commute that want to stay in Durham and work in Durham. Mm. Very interesting. Kind of cool. They want to yeah. find jobs. Yeah. And, and, I, and I've talked to realtors in Barrie and I've talked to Rob Golfie out in Hamilton, Burlington, same thing. People want to stay and work. They don't want to go downtown anymore every day. No. Oh, it's exhausting. You know? well, they've had, they had the experience of just staying home. Yeah. And well, that's, I guess that's the trigger, right? Yeah. The like, last why, years? Do I have to, why do I have to commute an hour and 15 yeah. minutes? And my boss has let me. Yeah. Sure. What's the difference now? So in five to 10 years, where do you see it going? Five years and then 10 years. Durham? Right? Yeah. I'm going to jump in here just before you say that and say, I am a Durham girl. I actually grew up in Pickering for the majority of my life. Oh, no. So I totally saw this explosion of Durham region in the last, I would say, like 10 to 15 years with the infrastructure that you're discussing as well. Um, and uh, just to jump off of where do you see it going five to 10 years from now, I've heard there's going to be about 70 condos built in Pickering. Wow. Is that a good thing? Mm -hmm. Is that a bad thing? Do you think that's going to explode further east? I, I don't think we can stop it. I don't think we should. I mean, no. uh, you know, part of the agenda for our our government and our province has always been, for, for our country for that matter, immigration. You know, we're built, we're all we're built on immigrants. That's Canada. It's where we pride ourselves in that. Uh, I'm not very proud of how the government's handled not building infrastructure and housing before allowing floods of people who now sometimes end up living on the street. I'm not very happy about that. But I'm not getting into the politics of that. And I know you don't want to. But uh, I think more homes are needed and condos are a great way to do it quickly. Um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's great. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think we need it. Uh, I don't think there's anything in the forefront or the, on the horizon as far as the agenda goes government-wise to stop people from coming in. And then there's population growth just from families having babies. Now, mm -hmm. that's stopping. I'm seeing more and more 30, 35, 40-year-olds still living with their parents than I ever have. Mm -hmm. That was unheard so of true. when I was a kid. My, mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, my parents were like, okay, get out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a different world now. Understandably, you know, I've got three little ones still living at home. Three older ones have moved up, but I have three little ones still living at home. Well, one's in university, the other two in high school. And I'm thinking, I'm not sure. I hope they can afford a home one day. Mm -hmm. You know, these are concerns, right? Oh, so absolutely. I do believe that this comes right back to what we all talk about regularly and consistently and, uh, for the past few years, supply and demand's out of whack. I think many condos will help that. I do believe, you know, housing growth, I think taking and cutting a lot of the red tape or blue tape, whatever you call it, black, whatever it is for builders and developers that they have to jump through hoops before they can put a shovel in the ground. Let's let them build. They build some homes, guys. We need them. Mm -hmm. I do believe that as long as you have five people that want one home, you're going to drive the price up. We need to go back to a more balanced, and I'm not sure we're going to get there. I'm not sure it's going to happen the next few years. So to answer your question in the next few years, I'm concerned we're still going to have a shortage of homes and supply and demand will still be out of whack. I'm wondering if we're going to start to see shifts in things like they did downtown London, England years ago, where they used to have a three-story home that's now three separate deeds called flats. Yeah, I'm wondering if that's that. going to start happening in Toronto or I'm wondering if, you know, tiny homes, which I heard are starting to be allowed to be built and put onto bigger residences, bigger lots. It's a big deal right? for people in Toronto. Sure. Yeah, I'm wondering if that's going to start to to sprawl where uh, they'll support more uh, multiple homes, which I have seen that more so. I, th I think that the government at a provincial, uh, federal uh, and the municipal level are starting to uh, table and discuss things needed with regards to housing. But there needs to be a lot of change, a lot of change. So for the next few years in Durham Region, I see, I still see continued growth and development. I do. It's going to happen. It's beautiful. You fly over Durham Region in a little plane and you still see lots of green space, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's going to keep developing.
You don't so, want to take a highway. You can take a, a like a back road and you're driving you, you, and you can. for yeah. long. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So I know at one point, maybe you can express this better, 10, 15 years ago, Bowmanville, Clarington, they were, you know, investment hotspots and whatnot. Where do you think the next hotspot is for investors or first time home buyers looking to get in the market and gain some appreciation in the Durham region or in the East End? So investors, you mean people that have already owned a home and they're buying another home? I guess twofold. So perhaps you could answer it for investors or even for first-time home buyers looking to capitalize on equity, like growth mm -hmm. in their home. Everybody's an investor, right? I there mean, you go. Well, even if it's our principal residence, I don't recommend thinking of it as investment. I think that you keep that one, hang on to that one. You know what I mean? Um, or keep moving up, right? So um, the next opportunity, uh, well, that's a great question. I would say... Being able to get into any market in real estate right now, I still see as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that sounds so cliche. Uh, in my opinion, rates are still low. Like, don't get me started. I've seen 18%, right? Now, relative to prices, sure, they were a lot lower than absolutely. Uh, our income, uh, combined incomes are a lot higher too, though. Um, I'm wondering also if we're going to start to see combined Bind people buying homes. I see my daughter, second year university, there's five of them in a home. Are two of those people going to start getting together, buy a home, two people on a deed? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering. Interesting, because they're already used to living like that until they can at least get their jobs up and running, get married, and then go on their way. But at least they have equity. They bought a home together. Because imagine if you could take two young people and cut the qualifying in half, because that's ultimately what mm -hmm. you do. Mm -hmm. So the next great spot, I'm already starting to see some growth and some interest, and people are starting to say, Maybe it's the parents. Okay, son, it's time to move out. You're 35. <laughs> well, okay, Lindsay's not too far anymore. You know, I'm seeing Lindsay and Peterborough start oh. to take off. Uh, poor Perry's just the same price, literally, as, you know, Durham region everywhere. Right? Mm -hmm. It's expensive. Uh, Bowmanville's gone up, shot up. So you really need to move out. Uh, work that 401 corridor out, Port, Port Hope, Coburg. Uh, that's, that's booming right around if you go up to Lindsay, Peterborough. Uh, it's starting to happen. It's really it's really taken off as well. Some would say it's even not affordable. I've had people tell me they can't believe how expensive Sudbury is. And we know that's a long drive, right? So oh, yeah. I know it's, it's crazy. It's yeah. crazy. So uh, I guess my answer would be more specific to what can you do to make it affordable to buy wherever you possibly can as an investor or a first-time buyer, whether that's taking in boarders or roommates, whether that's uh, you know, applying for and getting a basement apartment, legal or not, get get that second income and buy a home, get in your home. Um, or, you know, drive a little bit, drive a little bit more. I remember when I bought my first home. Um I moved, I, we came to Durham, we came to Oshawa and I lived in Thornhill at the time. I, we couldn't afford Toronto back then. It was crazy. Are you crazy? But Oshawa was, it was reachable. It was reachable. Mm -hmm. And it seemed so far. <laughs> oh, <laughs> at yeah. the time it was. Right. Okay. Yeah. Oshawa was so, even in my career in the beginning was like, I put a bunch of men that mostly that were like wanted investments, like du duplexes. Sure. And they all were, it was affordable. 500 grand or I, and for someone that paid and you were cash flowing. Now yeah. it's in their double and it's impossible to find. Yeah. Good luck yeah. finding them. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> they were like hanging fruit. Like I was yeah. like, oh, this guy built this duplex. Yeah. Great. Let's, let's do it. Like yeah. they did all the work for you out in Durham. Right. Yeah. But now it's unheard of. It's hard to find. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. All cool. right. Moving mm -hmm. on to the fun stuff. Uh oh, amazing. We, we have a fun question that we always get to ask our guests. So if you have mm -hmm. one funny, horrific, wonderful story that you wanted to share about real estate, we would love to hear it. What's it's, your best it's, it's real estate funny story? and horrific. I don't know if it's wonderful. I don't know. Go but for I'll it. I'll tell you. I love it. Um, all right. I'll tell you because it's about me. So I'm not throwing anybody else under the bus. It's about me. This happened to me when I was not taking my business seriously. Um, I had a couple of years where I was slacking a bit and uh, maybe too many evenings in the bar. Um, and I went and did an open house the next morning. And I probably shouldn't have. I probably should have called in sick. How do you call in sick for an open house? Well, you can't, right? So, <laughs> you know, I'm a trooper. I showed up. And I remember meeting the clients. They were leaving at the time. I had all the signs of, hey, guys, have a good have a good afternoon. I'll, you know, see a couple of hours. I'll be done. Anyway, they returned home to me sleeping on their couch. <laughs> Woke me up. You know, I'm out, right? <laughs> Dan. Dan, how was the open house? Oh, yeah, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. This <laughs> That's awesome. Probably the most horrific, embarrassing moment in my career. Definitely one of them. And uh, I'll tell you that because it's kind of fun. They were cool. Uh, they laughed. They were, I did go on to sell that home mm -hmm. and I did keep and maintain that relationship with those people. Thank goodness, because they had every right to be angry with me and they weren't. Um, so that was embarrassing. 
We all do funny things. That is okay. That is awesome. That is a great story. A I nice love it. made bed. I like it. It's hard it's okay. to deny sometimes. I think I even had the TV on. <laughs> You're incredibly successful. You're okay. It's all good. It worked out. I, changed, I changed my habits. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Amazing. Let's. So we do something called the rare roundup. It's a fire uh, round. We ask you a bunch of questions quickly and you give us I'll your I'll do answer. my best. Okay. Your favorite neighborhood. I'd have to say Brooklyn. I live there and I love the restaurants. I'm really also, my wife and I are really enjoying downtown Whippy. Cool. Some cool restaurants. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Some cool restaurants popping up. It's happening. Nice. Amazing. And uh, I love Yorkville. I have a condo there. I do love Yorkville. That's not GTA though, really. Is That's Toronto. <laughs> but I do love Yorkville. <laughs> yeah. It's... <laughs> How can you, it's like almost as if you're on vacation every time. I'm just careful. To, I love it. So hold on a second yeah. here. You're the person who's the suburban who then comes into town, town Toronto and has a lovely condo. I love it, Dan. Is I that do. what you do? I do. I aspire to be. I love it. I love it. And uh, I'm just careful. I don't take all my girls there at once. Okay. Too expensive. There you oh, go. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> That's you awesome. have five, right? Five daughters? I have five daughters. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're their poor dad. I have a son and five daughters, yeah. <laughs> um... As a, what's your favorite fast food on the go? I'd say Barbarito. Mm-hmm. I think Barbarito. It's it's pretty good. It's, you know, have you tried Kettleman's yet, though? Where? No. Kettleman's? No. It's a drive through bagel sandwich. Phenomenal. Huh? Where is it located? Yeah. Tell us. Well, that's a, that's in Durham. That's at uh, Garden and Totten. Garden and Taunton. Yeah, Kettleman's. By the Home Depot. Okay. Right? Next okay. Time. I know exactly Try where Kettleman's. you're Try Kettleman's. Okay. Oh, totally. Oh, oh, it's coming up fast. It's good. <laughs> it's new. Very new. Okay. I just have to shout out my favorite new Durham restaurant. I'm sorry. I'm killing the yeah, rare roundup. Me. I'm sorry. Tell me. Is it called Butchie's? Uh, Butchie's is on Dundas, The barbecue? Right? Yeah, yeah. The that, barbecue yeah. My with, the been with the outdoor? One of my daughters. Oh they loved my it. God. They loved it. Phenomenal. I haven't been yet. Ribs, they pulled pork, yep. the whole situation. There's coleslaw. Yes. There's beans. I'm sorry. I'm taking over the podcast with my no, lovely No, they loved food. it. But Durham's got some serious eats there. Yep. I'm going to go. I didn't even know about yeah, that. Oh, my God. Butchie's is pretty new. Yeah. 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 It's good. They even serve you alcohol on the patio on these like lovely picnic tables. My wife didn't tell me that. And our final question for you is, what makes an agent rare? Consistent, focused work ethic. Love that. Consistent, focused work ethic. And, 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 and I know realtors who want to be consistent, and I know realtors mm-hmm. who have a great work ethic, who've left our business because they didn't have the proper focus. And by that, I mean the specific things that they should have been doing. I, it bothers me when good realtors leave this business. I mean, I know a lot of realtors who should leave our business, but that's another day. But, but for the realtors, we lose because they just didn't have the right tools or they weren't connected with the right people or, mm-hmm. uh, or know specifically what to do. Because let's be honest, you get your license, you come into this business, you're thrown to the wolves. Nine times out of 10, it's like, here's your keys, here's your monthly bill, or here's your split or whatever. Good luck. I hope you make it. If you don't, I'll get somebody else. That's it. You know, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of being call your, funny, Call everybody you know. And yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was my first experience in the business. Mm-hmm. You know, my, my broker, I said, went to him, I said, and I begged to get into Remax in 89. No, go go work at, you know, Cole Bank had some great up and coming training. Century 21 had programs. He said, go there for you and then come here. He wouldn't hire me. I had to beg. He put me on probation for six months. I had to pay six months desk fee up front, business cards and signs up front. And I was on probation. You ever heard of that? Somebody on probation and real estate? That was me, 19, November of 89. Yeah. My broker owner of Remax Apple back in the day, Remax. Wow. So and he, and I, so I go to him on the, the Friday, uh, pardon me, the Monday. That was the Friday. Harvey. I go to the Monday. So I finally got the courage up to go to three o'clock. So uh, what should I be doing? She said, that's why I don't hire new realtors. That's what he said to me. He took the phone book out of his drawer. For those who don't know what a phone book is, it's a directory that has everybody's phone numbers in it from the community. He puts it on the desk and he says, start calling people, tell them you work at Remax and do they need to, don't anybody think they're buying or selling their home? Okay, that was my training. That was my training. I said, okay, so I'll start doing that. So I pulled the phone book out. And he said, as I'm walking out the door, he said, oh, do yourself a favor, start at G. Nobody ever gets to G. <laughs> in other words, everybody else has yeah. failed, A, B, C, D, E, F, right? So- yeah, that's, that's you know, the, we're thrown to the wolves early on. I think work ethic is important with focus. I don't think that was the best focus. I believe that if you call my coaching, I'm a damn plan coaching, we can give you specific focus that allows you to do things that make more sense. Um, and, and with that focus, if you've got drive, you're full time, you want to make it in this business, don't leave because you don't have the right focus. You don't have the right specific things you should be doing daily. Check in with us. We'll get you busy, especially with a changing market, as you referenced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? It's tough now. It's, it's not as easy now. But it doesn't mean you can't do it. There's still going to be homes sold. Mm-hmm. Right? 
Absolutely. Best business in the world, guys. Thank I you. genuinely believe it. Well, we think that you are one of the best guests that we have ever had. You are absolutely brilliant. And this entire podcast contained so much information mm-hmm. for new agents and seasoned agents. And I got a lot out of it. And yeah. it makes me, it almost grounded me a little bit just to, you know, everybody feels anxious. Everybody doesn't, you know, wants to make sure that we're making the right decisions in this market. But you, yeah, it made me feel grounded. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate having you here. And for all of our listeners, make sure that you go ahead and hit that five star like button because Uh we love those five stars, not four, not three, five. And and make sure you follow Dan, Dan's team, their coaching company. You can find them where? Dan Plama Coaching, danplamacoaching.com. Appreciate you and thank you for having me. Of course. Very welcome. Thank you for coming on, Dan.